Across Global, sparking innovative thoughts. สวัสดีค่ะ Welcome to another episode of Texas Global Podcast. You're listening to this special episode with me, Chawa Rat Yong j i r a n o n the global content editor of Texas Media. Of course, a lot of you already know me by my nickname, p u p e i Today, we're going to talk about something that we have learned about、uh, for a long time, and and is probably going to be the future. Of how we are, we live our lives, and that is、uh, smart cities. Now, with the COVID 1 9 outbreak in 2020, there is the question of has there been a change in what defines a smart city, and、um, how are we going to have our cities looking in the future? Today, we're going to talk about it with、uh, Julian Malaret, Mia Laret, sorry, a VC from. It invests partners are Eurasia, a large European VCPE manager actively working in Asia. Julian also deploys a smart cities fund for the European Union, the United States, and Asia. And this fund is dedicated to providing digital solutions for sustainable cities. It is supported by 15 corporate and international investors in the European Union and Asia. <music> Ah, hello, Julian. Hi. Thank you so much for having me today. Ah, yes.、Um, I think、um, th- we'll probably have to start with what is the definition of a smart city,、um, because obviously it's probably e- e- evolved throughout、uh, the year. Can we hear from you in your opinion?、Uh, what is your definition of a smart city? Sure.、Um, so it's actually a very good question、um, because there's actually. Two completely different visions of what a smart city is and should be, and we only <laughs> try and work on one of these visions. So the, the the first vision is building a city from scratch and making it smart. So these are you know big projects, the ones where you'll see Tencent in Shenzhen taking you know control of a whole district and building it. Same thing、um, with Google trying to build that in Toronto,、uh, closer to us.、Uh, you know NTT, the Japanese.、Uh, You know, technology company trying to do that in Kuala Lumpur or Sumitomo, in、um, in Ho Chi Minh. So it's really the idea of saying, okay, there's nothing there. Let's build something new and let's make it smarter and and let's embed a lot of communication technologies right in that.、Mm-hmm. Um, that's not at all the vision that we're interested in.、Uh, we think it takes. It's very difficult to do.、Uh, one big player. Uh, can't cover all the technology needs of a of an area. So what we're interested in is the opposite. We're interested in the existing city, the legacy city, and it's all its messiness. Whether it's you know whether it's in Bangkok, in Kuala Lumpur, in Paris, or Singapore, the existing city. And we're trying to take this legacy city, which is、uh, not connected, and essentially bring in a lot of new digital services that use private data, public data. Uh, it could be data from your smartphone. It could be data from,、uh, you know, a bus stop. It can be weather data. It can be you name it. We're using this、mm-hmm. data to provide new digital services that make the city smarter in the sense that it's easier to live in.、Um, it's、uh, consuming less resources, especially there's a big、uh, climate change, energy transition element in what we do. It's、um, sometimes better designed. And lastly, under COVID, it's more resilient. It's helping us get back to our lives faster. So that's really the vision of the smart city we have, which is the legacy city and making it a better place to live through different digital services. That really makes sense. I mean, land is limited, isn't it? <laughs> But you know, like it is it, it, in terms of you can if you can compare like starting from zero to actually like renovating or. Or you know, transforming a, an old city、uh, that has existed for hundreds of years.、Um, I think option B is a bit hard, isn't it? Because you really have to be careful in, in how you go about reserving and, and, but at the same time, innovating it, right? Yeah, absolutely. But that's that's where you know、um, that's where the job becomes interesting because we we want to preserve you know part of the history. 
but we also are, are building and renovating the city for the existing inhabitants, right? And so I'm based uh, right now, um, you know, in Singapore, um, and our, you know, you mentioned the fund we're deploying. The fund we're deploying, actually, the the new one we're we're deploying now has actually Thai uh, corporate partners in it. So we're we've been working um, now more and more in Thailand, um, mm -hmm. and we're starting to bring, you know, uh, smart city solutions that we've seen in Paris or in China, and we're bringing them to Bangkok. And it's completely compatible with the existing city. So I'll give you guys one example, you know, just mm -hmm. uh, because it's a, it's a it's a live one. We've just started in Bangkok. Um, we we are bringing um, you know uh, battery swapping for electric scooters to Bangkok. Now, if you know you guys live in Bangkok or if you're living in Thailand, you know that most of the the food delivery, the delivery that we're, is being done now, it's it's growing super quickly. Um, but yes. it's mostly being delivered with traditional motorbikes um, mm -hmm. or, you know. And so what we're doing is we're we're bringing to Bangkok uh, a solution where we've invested in China, which is essentially it, it's um, it's pretty inexpensive scooters, electric scooters. They cost, you know, three to eight hundred dollars U.S. Um, and then once you have the scooter, especially for the people who deliver, you swap the batteries and you have unlimited battery swapping. Uh, so we retrofit stations with batteries in them. Mm -hmm. um, and you can use it and it's really useful for for delivery because it's it's a green delivery. There's no use of petrol. There's no emissions um, for the people who are delivering. It's it's just as just as cheap as if they were charging at home. Um, it's actually safer because, you know, when you charge batteries at home, sometimes they can explode and that yeah. brings fires. Yes. And and the batteries are recycled, which is great because, you know, before them, you know, you would finish using your scooter and it might end up in a landfill. Whereas with these centralized swapping stations, uh, the companies do well on recovering the batteries and recycling them. So basically everyone's winning, you know, for the delivery. You're de you will never miss out on a delivery for lack of power. Um, it's greener. It's just as cheap as the existing. And it's it's just a better and, and it's completely you can you can put this in the existing city. We're going to fit these uh, stations and petrol stations and it's working. So, you know, this is an example. Right. But there's many other examples which are small kind of discrete services that use data. I mean, you know, for this company, you download an app, it tells you where the stations are, you go to the station next to you, it recognizes mm -hmm. your scooter, it recognizes your face actually for the payment, there's it's visual AI, and you swap your battery in three seconds. So is that like, you mean like you go to a station and um, it's like a charging station or something like that and you just swap it's, it? it. It's, it's like a, a full battery. So imagine you're sitting on your scooter Yes. And the scooter has a battery which you can put in and, and, and put out, take out. Yeah. Uh -huh. And when you get close to the station, uh, a, a cabinet, it's a cabinet with different batteries in it. The cabinet uh -huh. will open and then you can change your battery in three seconds. Oh, and it, it yeah. Gone. OK, I get you. I get you. Yeah. It's kind of like what we're seeing with, let's say, like uh, chargers for like um, for phones and smartphones. Exactly. Phones. It's yeah, the same right? idea. Like when oh. you go for your charger and you're going to a restaurant and you're out of power and you you can you can use the a power bank. It's the same idea. And it's, but how, uh, how how big are these these batteries? Are they're they quite like... small. You know that you can oh. lift you can lift two yourself and and swap them. And just oh. to give you an idea, right mm -hmm. in China now, you know this this company is called eMotor. Chinese name is Ihuan Dian. Mm -hmm. um, you know this company now has one hundred and fifty thousand you know paying users monthly in China today. And you know last year at the same time before COVID, it was maybe ninety thousand. So. There's many other examples that we could talk about today, but this is a simple one. It's making, you know, transportation easier, cleaner, mm -hmm. um, just as affordable, and it's totally compatible with the existing city. I think that's a great solution because um, I, I've been to Shanghai before and <laughs> and it's, it's just like, whoa, I mean, it's so quiet. <laughs> exactly. if, you, if you come from a city where everyone is, you know, busy riding, riding around in their, you know, in their uh, motorbikes and everything. It, it's really loud. It, it's, there's a lot of smoke. There's a lot of pollution. And I was just really delighted to actually go and see that, um, you know, it can be done. Exactly. But, um, there are always challenges, though, in terms of integrating that into a system that perhaps maybe a lot of people are already used to, right? Yeah, and that's where you know this is one example where you know it's 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 we're bringing it to Bangkok because it's it makes a lot of sense, but it has to be affordable, right? And mm -hmm. or else who wants to use it? And that's one of the big challenges of smart city services is you need to make it in such a way that people want to embrace it. And so you know if you look at the price of a scooter, 
that uses these batteries today, you know, three to 800 US dollars, it's very comparable to the price of a, a motorcycle uh, that you could buy. Um, except that, you know, when you're going to pay for the charging, you're going to pay 20 bucks per month, 30 bucks per month for unlimited charging. So it's really convenient. Um, and that's an example. But, you know, in, in, in Bangkok, we've um, there's other solutions that we're really interested in bringing that are in complete different parts. Um, the vision that we have right now, and I think it's super interesting for, you know, uh, for those who are living in Southeast Asia and, and beyond is that the companies that we're supporting that are the most valuable, the most interesting are at the intersection between the property sector, mm -hmm. the mobility sector and the energy sector. So, you know, we most of the investors are in our funds, they they're either big power utilities, they come from the power sector or they're mobility companies like automotive companies or they're they're property developers. And they're all looking for new digital solutions, right? And the ones that are the most valuable are the ones where it kind of overlaps. So I'll give you another example, just because we had a huge, uh, we announced a huge SPAC uh, three weeks ago uh, in a company called Volta Charging for mm -hmm. about $2 billion. So this is a very big SPAC. Um, and what Volta Charging does, it's a US company and based in uh, Silicon Valley, they essentially are building charging points for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. But they look like advertising panels. So, you know, when you look at it, it looks like an advertisement panel, like a public advertisement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's actually a charging station. So the, the advertisement pays for the charging. So the charging is going to be free for the oh, user. Okay. Yeah. So it's free yeah. for the user. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was my next question. And I mean, we're, we're still with this issue because I think it is really a big part in what creates a smart city. And that is, you know... Um, you know, more environmentally friendly transportation via um, electric um, uh, power. What, when you take a look at, let's say, the development in China, um, I said I was talking about this earlier today, how um, they are building, they are creating an infrastructure to to support EV vehicles uh, and everything. So when you come into cities like, for example, Bangkok, uh, you've talked about how you've worked with like your uh, private sectors. What about the public sector? I mean, uh, how are you going about to to creating this uh, infrastructure? So I think we have to you know recognize that you you know there's the you, you do need to work with the public sector in many instances. So if you take for example you know companies that did free floating bicycles like Mobike in China, right? When they mm -hmm. when they went out. Uh, and started abroad um, the, in the countries where they didn't work closely enough with, the, you know, with the local uh, administration, it didn't really fly well. Uh, and so I, I think for some services, you absolutely need to. Um, the, the, the flip side of that is that sometimes it can go more slowly in certain countries. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, yes. So it really depends, you know, in China, for example, when you have the government backing for, you know, let's say battery swapping, uh, you know, for example, the Chinese uh, uh, grid company, the electrical grid company is an investor as well. So they have huge institutional support. So it goes quickly, sometimes faster, sometimes it can slow it. So most of the services that we're supporting um, are usually, you know, private sector services, um, commercial, and they can operate without necessarily having to go through, um, you know, a lot of uh, regulatory hoops. You know, when you're putting a, 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 a swapping station on, uh, on the premise of, let's say, a, a big petrol station it's mm -hmm. their own premise right if uh mm -hmm. if they're doing it so it, it doesn't necessarily need that regulatory support mm -hmm. but i'll give you um an example where it does um mm -hmm. you know right now in uh in singapore we're launching uh, another company that was start started in france and then went to the uk and now bring to asean it's around um property tech um mm -hmm. it's a very interesting service basically what they're doing is is elevator maintenance as a as a a marketplace and if you think about cities you know um we all especially in for example in bangkok or here in singapore we we live in in vertical cities um a lot of elevators and the problem with elevators is that when uh they're installed there's six companies in the world that build them and then they maintain them which costs a ridiculous amount mm -hmm. and so what this company is doing is saying okay well just like an uber model i'm going to recruit the technicians who used to maintain these elevators uh, they're going to become their own bosses on my platform. Um, we're going to do elevator maintenance much cheaper. Um, it's going to be better done and, and it's going to be IoT connected. We install a device. And so here, obviously, if you want to do that, you know, the, the local authority in, in, in Thailand or in Singapore is going to have to approve you. They, they will let anyone 
you know, it can't just be anyone who goes and, and does elevator maintenance. There's a security issue, right? So some of the businesses you will need, you know, that kind of regulatory approval. Okay. So that comes to my next question. And that is, uh, what is the biggest challenge in, you know, initiating a smart city, you know, in the form of, you know, transforming present cities that we have now? I mean, we talked about the slowness, we kind of hinted about, you know, how if you, if you go about, you know, trying to contact the public sector, of course, there is that time frame that is quite long. Um, but other than this, uh, what are the main challenges that you face when you when you start a project? I think the challenges are very similar to what you'll see in other sectors. Um, you know, the usually it's it's a metric of, okay, cost, you know, people want to use new services, smarter services that, you know, whether it's ride hailing as it started as a new service in the city from your app, whether, you know, food deliveries, they want to use it as long as it's convenient and affordable. So I think the first, you know, major issue is it just has to be just as good as the legacy service, but sometimes more affordable and just more convenient. So if you can't get the right price point, um, that's just going to be an issue, right? Um, you know, so it's just imagine that your your UX is not on your on your mobile phone or on your on your web. It's in the real city life. the The user experience of these new services, uh, whether it's in mobility or in properties, I mentioned, has to be quite quite easy and quite inexpensive. So, how do you get there? You need a lot of of good designing, and you need technologies, which is the second point, which is. You know, a lot of the services that we're building 10 years ago, you couldn't have done them. Mm. It just wasn't technically feasible. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the other um, benefit, but also a challenge is there are new technologies in the background that are enabling these services. And, uh, you know, certainly if you take uh, in Southeast Asia, um, one of the big enablers has been what we call uh, IoT, you know, uh, connectivity. So very low cost connectivity. You know, we use 3G, 4G, now 5G phones, right? It's a, it's a quite a, an expensive form of, of, of wireless. It's, it require, you know, gives us a lot of bandwidth, but the technology you're using in smart city very often is actually called zero G. So it's very, very slow. It moves very few packets, but it's super inexpensive. And so when you want to collect data from sensors, um, it's very cheap to do that. And, you know, 10 years ago, we just didn't have these networks, you know, um, in, in Thailand, you know, KAT is building these networks in Malaysia. We have them now. And it's because the data collection has become so cheap with mm -hmm. these new networks that mm -hmm. you can make the service affordable. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's another you know challenge because we it, it's um, you need these technologies to come in. Uh, sometimes it takes more time. Uh, sometimes it's going to go super fast. It depends on the geography, but you need them in place. If you don't have them in place, it just becomes too costly to power these new smart city services. Mm, yeah, it's it's all about that, you know. Okay, so I'm going to go on to another aspect that I wanted to talk about, and that is, um, you know, the change in how we are living with COVID-19 now. Um, people are working from home. Uh, it is truly disrupting urban life. You know, we see that across the world where big cities, where everyone at the one point, you know, was rushing to try and get a piece of it, you know, a piece of property in it to, to you know, work, to, to have a connection with others. And now deciding to move to, you know, the, the outside parts of the city, you know, working yeah. from home, people are, instead of buying condominiums or buying homes. Right. Um, how is this, uh, is this impacting um, the original plans or the original view of, of how smart cities are going to be? So it's, um, it's accelerating the shift. I think that's the biggest mm -hmm. response we, we have now. You know, um, when we started with Smart City Fund One, this was 2016, you know, we were driven by kind of two ideas. One was around climate change. We thought, okay, if we can have an impact on the way, you know, cities consume energy, consume resources, then we can have a big impact on the world because that's where 85% of resources are consumed, right? So we start out with a vision around climate change. And then we, we also came with a, a, a vision that's quite social as well. 
um, trying to better, but essentially making cities more inclusive, making, you know, for example, lodging more affordable, uh, many of these issues, right? And so a lot of these, you know, these two points require kind of new urban behaviors. And some of these behaviors had already, you know, were already there before COVID. So for example, just give you three, because we've seen a huge boom in these three areas. We were looking at, you know, everything on demand, even before COVID, right? So on-demand transportation, mm -hmm. on-demand food delivery, you know, most of that has increased, um, especially for the on-demand food delivery, for example. On-demand, uh, you know, ride-hailing, it depends on which, which point of the COVID, but on-demand food has just exploded uh, with COVID and, and you know, we're, we're, we've invested in companies that do, you know, EV logistics in cities and the the amount has just grown tremendously. Or the company I just mentioned around battery swapping, it's driven by scooter delivery. So that's accelerated. Um, in certain areas where we, you know, we have, we had invested as well, it, for example, in autonomous driving, mm -hmm. we're investors in China's leader of, they do autonomous electric buses. It's called WeRide. Mm -hmm. Before COVID, people didn't really want to go into an autonomous. They were like, why would I want to go into a drive, a car without a driver or a bus without a driver? Now, Actually, the fact that you're taking the driver out is mm -hmm. is making people go in. So that's uh, so, oh, so, yeah. so yeah. So there were kind of behaviors we saw before that have accelerated, and the big, the two big ones um, are definitely you know remote working. So that's you know that's changed a lot. It went if you take France for example, before lockdown there were 18 percent of people who were doing remote. During lockdown it was 65, and now we're still at 45 percent. So it's here to stay, right? And um, so those are the, the I guess, the, the three points is that COVID hasn't kind of changed the city, but it's accelerated new behaviors in, 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 in these three fields. I mean, after things, you know, get better with the vaccines and everything, um, do you see people still gathering in cities? I mean, in the, in the numbers that we've seen in the past or, or is it going to change, do you think? I mean, I, it's hard to say, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I don't have an answer to that. I think um, there's the things that we know, there's, there's, we do know that, yes, during COVID, um, you know, a lot of the second tier cities have benefited because they were there in Europe, for example, you know, instead of living in Paris, living in a second tier city where maybe there's historically less job opportunity for sure, but it's cheaper to live in and it's better quality of life. I think some people came to realize that, that they could have that because of remote working. So there's been, there has been, I, I wouldn't call it an exodus for sure, but there's been more people who have said, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this now. And I was thinking about it before, but now I can actually do it. My employer allows me to. So I think there's been a bit of that, how big it's going to be. It's hard to predict. Um, but there in the urban landscape, there are things that are, I could say definitive, um, and if you take, you know, the example of driverless, um, before COVID, we were only testing driverless shuttles, for example, in China. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we, these are certain services, and these services um, are here to stay. It's basically because it's allowing you to do on-demand buses. So you, it's an autonomous bus. It comes and picks you up. And when you do that, th actually, the road infrastructure will change. There's going to be changes to the way roads uh, build because you're going to need um, more lanes for bicycles. You're going to need more lanes for autonomous vehicles now, and that's going to definitely transform uh, cities in a certain sense. Mm, yeah, perhaps maybe it'll be able to breathe. It will have breathable cities. <laughs> exactly. It's not so crowded, but exactly. more efficient. Talking about that, and 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 talking about China, and uh, you know, Julian, you've said that um, a, a lot of case studies that you, you've mentioned is from China. Um, with the latest development that has to be made with smart cities throughout the world, um, uh, what city do you think is the best role model, uh, you know, for smart city development right now that you're seeing right now? So, yeah, I mentioned China a lot because, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, the, the, the audience today is also coming in from Southeast Asia and, and Bangkok and beyond. But a lot of the solutions that we're going to see in Southeast Asia are going to probably be tested and built at the beginning in China, and then um, you know brought over because they're reaching the right uh, price points. Um, I don't know if there's a model because every city is essentially going on to this uh, trend of using private public data to power new 
digital services uh, that make the city better and smarter. So every city has its kind of own roadmap, but there's definitely cities that are going faster than others. Um, and I think the the city today where we can say we're, 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 we're really looking super closely because it is a lab is uh, Shenzhen uh, in China. Mm -hmm. You know, Shenzhen, and you know, for those who aren't familiar with the city, I think pretty much everyone is, but Shenzhen, you, you know, 30 years ago was just a small little fishing village, uh, you know, in Guangdong. And today it's, it's a, you know, a huge, vibrant city, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that happened in the span of 30 years. Um, and so what Shenzhen is, is doing is um, it's, it's implementing a lot of new policies um, that use the different technologies we're talking about. So Shenzhen is one of the first cities in the world to have a 5G, 5G network. And if you think about autonomous, uh, one of the reasons we started in, in doing autonomous electric buses in Shenzhen and Guangzhou is because these 5G stations are there. And the benefit of 5G is very clear. I'll give you one example. If an autonomous electric bus, minibus, is stuck in traffic, mm -hmm. with 5G, you can, you can take control of the vehicle at a distance 20 kilometers away. It's called drive-by-wire. And someone in, mm -hmm. in an office of WeRide can take control of the vehicles and kind of uh, put it back into circulation. You can only do that if you have 5G. So Shenzhen mm. is, you know, this company, they do a lot of other things. They do high definition mapping. They do many other things you need to do it. But drive by wire is, is critically enabled by 5G. You can't do it on other types of networks to date. So that's an example. Um, mm -hmm. Shenzhen is also, you know, really interesting in the sense that it's also, in, it, it, made, it made it compulsory for all the taxis. And now a lot of the, urban delivery to be uh, electric. So it's really one of the first cities to go full electric. So it's got a lot of features that are super interesting. And one of the big ones, and we have to remember this, is that you do need consumer to embrace this. And that's one of the other things really unique about China is that, you know, they've there's a willingness to try and embrace things at a faster speed than pretty much anywhere else. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's a fact and uh, it's benefiting them. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, let, let's take a look at, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about this. Another perspective of uh, developing uh, smart cities is uh, data and, and how, how you manage that. Um, it is a really personal thing for, for people, isn't it? Um, and, but then you do need data for that development of smart cities. Uh, is there a way or have there been any developments in you know, having a more balanced way in uh, using personal user data? So, I mean, first of all, here, every, you know, every geography has different rules and regulations. You know, I come from Europe. We have a lot of policies on GDPR, which, which are very specific. And, and, and you can't use data in the same way that you can use it, for example, in, as in Singapore and China. So we have to recognize that um, different regulations, different countries. I think there's a, there's a part of the of the issue that, you know, there's some data that's very personal, you know, the data that's on your phone um, that, you know, that you can directly derive. And and some companies go around it either by asking you, of course, you know, your, your approval to use it, or um, some companies go about it by using metadata. It doesn't, it depends on what they need. It's not a silver bullet. On the one that's kind of tricky is the one that the data that comes from sensors, because Technically, you know, it's a sensor based data. It shouldn't be able to it's it shouldn't hinge on your privacy. But I'll give you one example, which where, you know, it's an issue. Um, so if you take in, in the US or in France, uh, it's not present throughout Asia yet. But we have um, smart electrical meters that basically, you know, give a give data on how we're consuming electricity in the home. You wouldn't think it's such a big deal, right? I mean, but actually, you know, if someone understands how you're consuming energy at home, they can figure out, you know, when you're up, when you're not up, when you're even flushing the toilet. You know, there's many things that you can derive from from that electrical meter and the loads. And that's why sometimes there's resistance to that. So sometimes data privacy pops up where you expect it the least. And it, it, it is an issue. And I think different, different geographies handle it in different ways. I think in China, they're pretty pretty forceful about it they you know data is is used in ways you would never imagine elsewhere and then in europe we're very conservative about it no what do you think about southeast asia i mean because uh Thai, thailand is pretty good in adopting and, and jumping into various platforms you know 
yeah. uh, without thinking sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I one of the things that I think is interesting, and uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, in the fund, you know, the fund, we, we invest in Europe, we invest in the US, we invest, you know, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and one of the things is that one of the reasons we're present here is because you have to live, you know, in an emerging uh, market like Thailand, like Malaysia or Philippines, Indonesia, to really understand, you know, what consumers there want, right? If you want to invest and offer them solutions. And one of the things that's true in Southeast Asia is that our cell phone is our lifeline in a way that is, un, 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 under, is not understandable when you're in the U.S. or in a more developed country. There are so many services, um, so many benefits of the phone. And I think we're willing to relinquish much more privacy just to have the benefits of those mobile based services in Southeast Asia than, you know, in more advanced economies, potentially where there's, it's not so much a lifeline, um, you know, and, and I think there's a willingness to, to, to do the trade off on your personal data versus the benefit of the service in ways that are very different from, for example, in Europe. Okay. All right. And, and talking about Thailand, um, we are like in other countries having an uh, increase in you know, elderly people, you know, we're an aging society. And uh, at the same time, you have to think about the future. How do we make life comfortable? Um, how, how do you think this is going to play in with um, smart city development? So, the you know, there's, I guess there's two answers to that. You know, one is, you know, one of the reasons we are in Thailand now and working with some of the groups there, um, you know, the, the, one, the first one that's public is San Siri, the property developer. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the things that's happening is so the aging population in Asia is, is is pushing towards you know two things very directly. One is a lot of automation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you know, for example, replacement of drivers and autonomous systems is appealing. Um, there's many reasons, but one of them is because there's just less there's less of a, a workforce to drive those vehicles. Um, and, and that's automation is kicking in. Same thing in a production. Um, so age, age is, is definitely uh, powering technologies around that, around automation or around augmentation. For example, if you take construction workers in, in Japan, their, their force can be augmented through some robotics forms. Um, it's marginal still, but it's growing. Um, the other side is making, you know, the, the latter years of, of you know our grandparents or ourselves in the future you know just easier and um and here i think there's th through smart cities i mean you're not going to solve the problem i think there's a lot of salt issues that have to do with medical that are not in my scope personally but could be in others one of the the things that for example i'll give you one example um if you take a company like uh, edf which is one of our um our investors or big utility they're not present um uh, they're not present directly in Thailand as a, as, a, as a service provider. But one of the solutions that they develop is actually being now used in Southeast Asia. It's, it's the ability for you to check on your parents uh, mm -hmm. on what the movements they're making in their home without, mm -hmm. with using sensors, without cameras. It doesn't film yeah, what's going yeah. on your home. I heard it, that, ha yeah. it has sensors and it, and it can tell you if there's unusual patterns, for example, and it'll flag them. And if there's an unusual pattern, it, it will give you... Uh, it'll it'll tell you, and you you can reach to your parents and make sure or your grandparents make sure that everything is okay. And that's one use that's being developed quite a bit. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I I think that is definitely one of the innovations that we've seen. There's a lot that we've talked about, uh, whether it's the EV uh, electric vehicles or or batteries that are coming in, and as you mentioned there, you know, um, platforms like smartphones, that the role that it takes into you know integrating everything together. Uh, just want to let uh, Julian have the last say into uh, what do you think will be the next big thing. You know, that will be driving smart cities this year. I, I, I don't know if there's one big thing for all the smart cities, but what I would say, and this is quite unusual, is that I think it's a particularly interesting time to recognize that a lot of the smart city innovation, some of the best services will come from emerging countries, essentially countries where because there's a, the legacy infrastructure is weak, they have to, they're, they're kind of leapfrogging through new uh, architectures, whether it's through your smartphone, through IoT networks, you name it. And they're offering services that are super critical that you didn't have in developed countries. And that, I think that's really, really interesting to, to, to see that. So it's maybe not one silver bullet, but I think it's, 
I think it's important for people to look into these uh, countries, which sometimes we don't look at for innovation, because there's a lot of innovation going on, um, and it's really interesting to follow it. Um, just a little bit, though, I, I don't want to miss out on this this point, and that is air pollution. Um, Julian, I don't know if you've you know seen or experienced it. Probably you're in Singapore. You know, there's a lot of pollution in in cities right now. Uh, are there any you know clues as to like how we can fight this with technology? Yes, there is, and uh, uh, it's it's almost like I I wanted you to ask me that question because we <laughs> we're actually supporting a company that's called Breezometer. It's an Israeli company, and what they're doing is they're giving you uh, information on pollutants in your city at every 500 meters, uh, very granular, and um, it's a data company. And so the data that you that Breezometer provides on pollution, um, it, it's you can find it. It powers the the pollution. Uh, data in your app phone in your sorry in your apple watch on your apple everything on the, the data that comes through apple whether it's the watch your phone the pollution data comes from breezometer um, if you're using a dyson uh, air purifier all the data on pollution is going to come through breezometer and so one one of the things that's really interesting about the technology and pollution is that of course you know breezometer is not going to solve uh the pollution issue no doubt about it but it does three things that are really interesting one is that it can track really early on when there's a leakage. When there's an industrial leakage somewhere, they find it really quickly and they spot it. And so you can get something solved quickly. The second is for people's comfort. Um, if you take Beijing, for example, it will tell you how pollution will evolve during the day. And I can tell you when I when I woke up in Beijing, the first thing I looked at was the pollution level. But it didn't tell me if the pollution was going to get worse or better during the day and why. And mm -hmm. this they do. And the last thing is for people who have health conditions, uh, especially asthma, it mm -hmm. can it also tracks pollens, for example. And it can tell you uh, if it's going to be huge pollen day, how and why and give you pollen levels uh, so you can adapt yourself. So it, it empowers you. And sometimes it helps to resolve it. It doesn't suppress it, um, but it, it tackles one part of the problem. It's super interesting. They they just do it. It's a pure data company. Um, that's exciting, especially since Thailand now is having problems with pollution. Um, of course, not the end solution. Of course, uh, you know we still have to deal with the, uh, you know, burning and slash and burn and everything. But at least that it's, it's clue us to like you know as we develop technology, we perhaps can you know anticipate the the problem coming forth um julian thank you so much for being with us here today uh i really think that we got great insight from you on what you're doing what is happening with smart city development and we look forward to hearing more about what will happen with your smart cities fund and of course uh hopefully you'll be joining us as well with our annual event the global tech sauce uh summit and so for all of you who are interested in this issue and others, uh, of course, you can always come and visit us at our website, TechSauce, and uh, find out more. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll, it'll be a pleasure to be at TechSauce Global this year again. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. TechSauce sparking innovative thoughts.